What do a lipstick, a microwave and a car paint have in common? I bet a question caught you by surprise. Well, should you want to analyze the manufacturing process of each of these products, you'll find that in all three cases, mica is used. Mica, from the Latin word mico, I shine, is a very special group of minerals. In fact, they are easy and perfect flaking, even by simple rubbing with fingers, splits them into very thin but elastic and flexible foils and scales, with a characteristic mother of pear luster. Their versatility of use is remarkable. In addition to the possibility of being combined with other layers of material, they can be ground and used in the form of powders or flakes and possess a natural low electrical and thermal conductivity. Because of these properties, it's possible to find their use in most cosmetics on the market, such as eyeshadows and foundations, but also in making paints, oven windows, heating systems and even toothpastes. Of course, just as with other minerals, mica must be sorted, mined and processed before it's placed on the market for sale. If you have never heard of them, maybe I can also explain why. According to the Observatory of Economic Complexity at the Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in 2021 the market for micas had a total commercial value of $237 million. In purely economic terms, these minerals participate in only 0.000011% of the global market. A trifle in practice when put in relation to their variety of uses. The country that exported the largest amount in monetary terms was China. China, with a total of $61 million. This was followed by the Netherlands, India, Madagascar and France. In terms of imports, however, the main buyers turn out to be Japan, China, Germany, the United States and Belgium. Until a few years ago, the use of mica in cosmetic products was a source of pride for the major multinationals in the sector, because these are elements that are already present in nature and therefore not synthesized in laboratories, which allows them to add the natural stamp to their makeup of choice. This was, as I said, until a few years ago. Today I want to focus on two of the nations I just mentioned, India and Madagascar. Similar to what happens in other so-called underdeveloped or developing countries, the logic of profit involves costs beyond those in money. I am talking in this case about the exploitation of labor, which unfortunately also and especially concerns children. And to talk about it, I have referred to two investigations centered on surveys, interviews and field observations supported by statistics regarding the volume of domestic microtrades. But we'll get to that slowly. Let's start with India. In 2016, a Thomson Reuters Foundation survey conducted over three months in the Indian states of Bihar, Jharkhand, Rajasthan and Andhra Pradesh shed light on a widespread reality of child labor in so-called ghost mines. The main type mined in India is Moscovite, also known as white or common mica, which although it can be used as an insulating material, is also used to give shine to makeup and skin care products. According to information extracted from the Zauba platform, which catalogues data regarding Indian import-export, Bihar exported more than 100,000 tons of mica in 2015. For the Indian Bureau of Mines, on the other hand, the whole of India would have produced about 20,000 in the same year. According to Reuters, this huge discrepancy is explained by the fact that 70% of production depended on the illegal mining of mica, conducted mostly in abandoned forests and quarries. And here we come to the darker side of ghost mining, the tender age of the victims involved. In fact, according to reports by the Children's Rights Advocacy Association Bachpan Bashao Andolan, in June 2016 alone, 20 children died in the mica mines, double the monthly average. In fact, widespread health risks related to the lack of proper safety systems and continuous exposure to dust include the respiratory problems, skin infections and deep cuts. This happens because in most cases, children are forced to collect the mica with their bare hands, and although these minerals aren't harmful, the environment from which they are extracted can be. Unlike adults, moreover, children can enter deeper cavities and so more easily prone to collapse, where they get to spend up to 8 hours. And they do it for a miserable pay. We are talking about between 50 and 300 rupees, or between 80 cents and 4 dollars a day. Since in 90% of cases these deaths go unreported to local authorities, the actual deaths could be far higher than those reported. I didn't know how dangerous the work in the mines is. 
Had I known, I would never have let him go. Farmer Vasdev Rai Pratap, father of a 16-year-old boy who died in June 2016 in Jharkhand, told Reuters. They said it took almost a day to dig out his body after the mine collapsed. They cremated him without telling me. Pratap then reveals that he accepted a payment of 100,000 Indian rupees, equal to $1,500. He did this in exchange for his silence to avoid ending illegal mining on protected forest lands that bring income to some of India's poorest areas. By protected forest land, the Reuters refers to the Forest Conservation Act, passed by India's parliament in 1980, a directive that resulted in a drastic reduction in mining and in the specific case of MICA led to a reduction in the 730 licensed quarries operating in 1964 to a maximum of 148 still active in 1986. And in 2014, the Indian Bureau of Mines reported only two MICA mining licenses in the entire state of Bihar, which is far from the reality of the situation. As early as 1993, Sanjay Kumar had documented in his book Problems and Prospects of Mineral Industry in India the existence of widespread illegal mines, especially in the Bihar MICA belt, that, although abandoned and lacking machinery, were still being exploited to sell the mineral to those who demanded it. It's possible to assume that unlike licensed quarries hidden in dense forests proliferated to meet the constant domestic and international demand for mica. To understand the phenomenon of ghost mining, we need to dig deeper. Reuters' investigation is intertwined with an interesting March 2016 report titled Beauty and the Beast. It was published by the network of international organizations Terre des Hommes, which fights against child exploitation and discrimination, in collaboration with the SOMO, an independent Dutch research center investigating multinational corporations. According to the data collected in the year 2015-2016, underage workers amounted to about 20,000, scattered in more than 300 villages in the state of Jharkhand alone. Page 21 of the document lays out the percentages of the population residing in the states of Jharkhand and Bihar living below the poverty line, their literacy level and the level of education of children and teenagers between the ages of 6 and 14. It immediately jumps out that these are much worse worse data than the Indian average, which might suggest a link to child labor. It's likely, in fact, that children find themselves working to make up, albeit with little pocket money, for the economic condition of their families, to the detriment of their education. Terdesom also refers to another problem endemic of the Indian reality – castes. According to a 2011 census referring to the sub-districts of the two federated states of Bihar and Jharkhand, in the largest of them, namely Rajaoli, Gawan and Domchanj, the percentages of Dalits, the so-called untouchables, or individuals of the lowest social status belonging to groups placed outside the pattern of the four traditional castes, are 29, 16 and 14 percent of the total population, respectively. If this reality is still so widespread, despite the formal abolition of untouchability and the discrimination that comes with it. What are the Indian government and the multinational corporations that import products from India doing to counter it? In January 2017, some 20 companies in the cosmetics and electronics industries set up the Responsible MICA initiative, aimed at funding educational and social projects to remove not only children but also families from working in the mines. To date, more than 80 multinational companies join, including Chanel, L'Oreal, Merck and Shiseido. Criticism, however, hasn't been slow in coming. First, it's worth noting that Beauty and the Beast clearly mentions in chapters 7 and 8 the major companies involved in the MICA market. Although Terdesom and Somo don't link them directly to child labor, they accuse them of supporting its perpetuation by continuing to buy minerals from India. It's not hard to imagine that these same companies, in anticipation of enormous image damage, have run for cover. For example, pigment company Kunkai, the largest importer of mica from Jharkhand and Bihar in the first half of 2015, with 6,200 tons worth 201 million Indian rupees, immediately stated it would help Terdesom save 10,000 children. The Jharkhand government also followed suit, promising to legalize the mines to also regularize work activities within them. 
Unfortunately, however, it seems that nowadays the situation hasn't changed at all. The pandemic hasn't only worsened the conditions of those living in contact with mines, but has created a vacuum in terms of information on the issue. In 2021, the Thomson Reuters Foundation again called out multinational cosmetics companies. The reason was that the funds allocated to the responsible MICA initiative, about a million dollars a year, wouldn't be used to combat child labor, since children would seem to continue to report infections and be victims of accidents of various kinds. Then there is another problem on the horizon. There has been criticism of the world of makeup, yet the electronics industry has no less impact on the global MICAS market. To realize this, let's now switch hemisphere and move to a country that is in worse shape than the Indian Federated States, Madagascar. We are talking about, according to World Bank data, about a purely agricultural nation that has a poverty rate of 80%. This percentage of the population, in fact, lives on little more than $2 a day. According to the World Food Program, food insecurity in Madagascar, also worsened by frequent environmental disasters, involves about 9 million people out of 28 total. If we admit the existence of a correlation between poverty and child labor, what am I about to say will not surprise you. In 2018, according to UNICEF, 47% of Malagasy children between the ages of 5 and 17 were employed as labor force. This reality is even more daunting in the south of the country, which has been plagued for nearly four decades by the anti-state violence of so-called Dahalo bandits, the cattle riders. According to Amnesty International, some 4,000 people, including thieves, civilians, security forces and soldiers, died between 2015 and 2019 as a result of the government's hard response to the Dahalo. The raids and repression continue to this day to claim victims. It's precisely in this context that most of the mica mining activities in which children are involved are concentrated. In this regard, in 2019, three years after Beauty and the Beast, Ter de Somme and Somo released a new report. It found the presence on Malagasy territory of 201 deposits of phlogopite, a mica that is used in the manufacture of electrical and thermal insulators, 176 of which would be located in the southern regions of Ihorombe, Androi and Anosi. The data strongly clashes with that reported by the Bureau du Catastre Minière de Madagascar, which as of July 2019 recorded 50 valid concessions for mica mining, or a quarter of the mines actually exploited. How is this possible? On page 23, the paper lays out what the supply chain for mica is in Madagascar. About 20,000 miners are involved in extracting the required minerals, which are then acquired by 400 buyers, including independents and employees of multinational companies operating in the territory. Then it's the turn of the transporters, who take the micas to five companies that are responsible for sorting and dividing them. One of these is 3H, whose complex is located in Tolagnaro, the capital of the Anosi region. It takes six hours of driving on narrow, unpaved roads to reach the plant by truck. Finally, goods are piled up at Port de Hola, built in 2009 by the Malagasy government and used as a docking port for cruise ships, cargo ships and reefers. Compared to mica mined in India, in Madagascar's case, this mineral goes to meet the needs of different sectors and apparently has only one interlocutor. In 2017, about 19% of the mica mined in Madagascar was exported by sea to China, where it was used as a component to produce wires, cables and household appliances, as well as finding use in the automotive industry. As Terre des Hommes shows on page 52 of its report, the four main multinational corporations importing Madagascar's mica are Chinese and engaged in the construction, high-tech and electronics sectors, and would buy the mineral for a very small sum, around 4 cents per kilo. Now we come to the sorest note, the trait that unites India and Madagascar in this circuit centered on labor exploitation. Of the 20,000 Malagasy miners, at least 10,000 are between the ages of 5 and 17. Terre des Hommes has reported cases of very young miners who are only fed at night, because they are constantly busy during the day, suffering frequent back and headaches from too many hours spent in uncomfortable positions and oxygen deprivation inside the tunnels. In 2019, NBC conducted an investigation on Malagasy soil following in the footsteps of Terre des Hommes, and quietly, without 
without announcing its arrival. Arriving in Ambuasari South, 70 kilometers west of Tolagnaro, reporters took photos of women and children intent on sorting nearby mined micas. The mothers interviewed confessed to earning the equivalent of $3 a week, working for 13 hours a day. At the time, NBC asked for an interview with 3H, whose manager, Hajar Anahari, said he was aware of child labor in the mica mines, adding, however, that it's not our problem, it's not our fault, but the parents of the children. If it wasn't for the mica, all these people would be bandits, and right now they would be stealing cars. Data exposed by Terdesom, however, say that in the southern regions of Madagascar, only 12% of children finish secondary school, and just 25% of the population has access to clean water. Maybe, just maybe, it's the state that is lacking, and it's the companies that are profiting from it. The multinationals surveyed, including Japan's Panasonic, America's Electroloc, and China's CR. RC said they were unaware of the reality of child labor and would investigate their own supply chains. The fact remains that widespread monitoring is very difficult, in part because the confluence of some of the mica extracted by Malagasy children within the flow of mica from India makes it virtually impossible to identify the products into which it goes. And when we consider that many other companies, including Ford, Fiat, Isovolta and Boeing, rely on mica sheets to make their cars and airplanes, the plot thickens. Obviously, I don't have a solution to the problem, nor am I here to tell you to stop buying an eyeshadow or a car. Unfortunately, although critical for its insulating properties and resistance to high voltage, Mica is still a niche market, on which not much of a spotlight is shining. In short, it's hard to see what goes where. As I anticipated, several companies such as L'Oreal haven't given up on mica in favor of synthetics, continuing to purchase it only through a transparent and traceable supply chain, in order to promote economic development and improve the living conditions of Indian workers. Britain's Lush, on the other hand, had already shown its intention in 2014 to remove all traces of so-called natural mica from its products because of its connection to child labor, and as of 2018 has switched to making synthetic Mica. Well, I am done here for today. The intention was to draw attention to a problem that exists and is very little talked about. So I hope, despite the amount of data, that I've managed to offer you a fairly clear and comprehensive analysis. Thank you all for your attention and we'll see you in the next video. Ciao!